Chris from Sailing Vessel Navigator in the Bahamas. So far in this series, we've taken a look at a few basic concepts and applied them for a deeper understanding. In tonight's episode, we'll take a look at how to navigate by the stars and the planets, forming lines of position from each. The stars and the planets are not too difficult. There are only a few minor changes from the typical sun sight that we've learned already. The hardest part is identifying them. So by now you realize that in order to sight something in the sky, you need a horizon to bring it down to. And unfortunately at night, that's very difficult to obtain unless the moon happens to be bright. So what that leaves you with is periods of dusk and dawn. Dusk is much more convenient for sleep, but dawn is much easier for star identification. The problem with dusk is that as the horizon is still visible, you only have a few stars out to identify. So unless you could rapidly identify them, bring them down and take a measurement, you're going to be in a world of hurt. And then by the time the stars are bright enough to see, the horizon might be too dim. So it's all really about star identification. And the best way to do it, honestly, is just to get an app for the iPad or something like that you can point at and it'll tell you exactly what star it is. If you're not an astronomer, then that's really an easy way to start. There's also the Nautical Almanac, so let's take a look at how to identify stars and planets with that. The Nautical Almanac has a handy star chart for northern, southern, and equatorial stars located towards the back. You can also use a device called the Rood Star Finder in conjunction with the Nautical Almanac to help plot the stars that are overhead at your position and time. The way you do this is you take out the base plate and flip it to the correct hemisphere and then overlay with the clear plate that's at the closest latitude to your position. You then calculate the local hour angle of Aries and simply spin the uh, tool to the appropriate bearing and then you'll be able to notice what stars are overhead. The best way to learn the stars is to learn some constellations and then expand your knowledge slowly as time goes by. I recommend learning three constellations. First is Orion the Hunter. Most people already recognize this constellation and it's located right over the equator so it's visible just about everywhere on Earth. The second constellation is Scorpio which is located pretty much opposite in the sky from Orion. So between those two, one of them is just about always visible and it's also over the equator. Both also have brilliant navigational stars in them. Betelgeuse in Orion and Antares in Scorpio, for instance. The last constellation is the Big Dipper, which is a northern hemisphere constellation, but since most people are in the northern hemisphere, that's why I include it. It's useful because it has a navigational star in it, Duby, as well as it being a pointer to the north star, Polaris. But constellations are no good. You need individual stars. There's thousands in the sky, but only certain ones are bright enough and spread throughout the sky to be useful. They are called the selected stars, and there's 57 of them. You can use other stars for sure, but these are the typically used stars that are listed in the daily pages of the Nautical Almanac. There's also a book called HO249, or Selected Stars, that can be super helpful if you're just starting out, since it lists which stars are visible to you depending on your position. So in any case, what do you do when you get a star sight measurement? It's the exact same process as the sun, with one exception. Instead of listing the GHA of every star, since the stars don't move in relation to each other, the Nautical Almanac only lists the GHA of a fictitious point in the constellation Aries, called the first point of Aries. Basically, the Almanac lists the GHA of Aries and then lists correction factors for each star, called Sidereal Hour Angle, or SHA. This is the angle west, and always west, of Aries. So the GHA of any star is just GHA of Aries plus SHA. The stars are great because they're almost an inconceivable distance away from our puny little solar system. In fact, the nearest one is over four light years away, which is an almost inconceivable distance. So for all intents and purposes, the stars can be considered as pinpricks of light on a sphere expanding around the Earth. They don't move in relation to each other over the times that we are concerned with as navigators. And in fact, there's 360 degrees in a circle, 365 days in a year. So you can see, it's really just about one degree per night that the sphere moves forever westward, one degree every night. So for our site of Murfak, otherwise known as Alpha Persei in the Perseus constellation, we'll correct for index correction and dip just like normal but this time we'll use the stars and planets table for our main correction. Now we'll look in the daily pages and determine the declination of Murfak. Again, since it changes so little, we can just pull the value right from the table and then there's no corrections.
Now it's time for the GHA calculation. So the first thing we'll do is pull the GHA of Aries from the daily page, and we'll note the SHA correction for MRFAC. GHA of MRFAC will equal GHA of Aries plus the sidereal hour angle. In this case, we shot directly on the hour, so there's no correction for minutes and seconds, but remember to do that if you need to. Now we assume a latitude and a longitude and head into the tables to pull out our tabulated figures. Again, to correct the computed height for declination increments, we can either use the direct math solution or the tabulated figures. Either way, we'll come up with the difference between the computed height and the observed height for our intercept, which is 17. Way back when we first started using the site reduction tables, I mentioned that you need to technically correct the azimuth figure for declination increments as well as the computed height. We haven't done that so far because the correction is typically so small that it doesn't matter. But since this is advanced concepts in celestial navigation, we'll correct it in this case. The way that we'll do it is we'll note the base azimuth figure and then pull the next tabulated azimuth figure from the tables. We'll note the difference between the two and then apply that to the declination increments. Divide the whole thing by 60 and then we'll come up with the azimuth correction. If you think about it, we're doing pretty much the exact same thing that we do for the computed height correction. We're just noting a table and doing it out by hand in this case. Either way, once you've corrected the azimuth figure and have your intercept, you can head to the plotting sheet and lay down your line of position. Now that we've got a handle on star sites, let's take a look at some planets. The ancient Greek word for planet actually means wanderer in our language, and that's because the planets appear to wander in the night sky against the backdrop of the stars. Because the planets are so much closer to us, their motion through the sky is much more complex than the stars. At the front of the Nautical Almanac, there's a discussion of the location of the planets that makes for some good reading. Additionally, there's a planet diagram. If you spin it on its side, you'll note that the month is on the bottom axis and the local mean time of meridian passage is on the left axis. If you really take a look at it, you'll see when the planet crosses your meridian. In other words, when it's highest in the sky. And that'll help you figure out where the planet should be in the sky. Mercury and Venus are inferior planets. They're located closer to the Sun than the Earth. And consequently, they move in their orbits faster than the Earth does. So from our perspective, what we see is ourselves being lapped in the great track race in the sky by Venus and Mercury over the course of the year. And what that appears to be as a navigator is that Venus is gonna slowly oscillate back and forth around the sun. Sometimes it's an evening star, sometimes it's a morning star. But either way, it's an unmistakable object that should be used whenever you have the chance. Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn, as well as Uranus and Neptune, are superior planets. They orbit the sun farther than the Earth. As the superior planets plod along in their orbits slowly, Earth laps them, and therefore their position against the backdrop of the night sky changes from night to night. And if you were to plot it out every day for six months or so, it actually plots a figure like this. It's called retrograde motion, and it's pretty cool if you ever get a chance to see a photo montage of Mars's position in the night sky. However, that's all academic. What it means for the navigator is that Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn, which are the superior navigational planets, it means that they're pretty easy to identify and use for navigation. So let's work a site for the planet Venus. Our index correction and dip corrections are pretty standard, and we determine our apparent altitude. Again, we'll use the stars and planets correction for main correction, but we'll note that there's an additional correction for Venus. Venus and Mars sometimes have additional corrections, depending on the time of year. Next, we'll move on and calculate the declination of the planet. It's listed handily on the left pages of the daily pages. So we'll note the declination and also the D number, which is at the bottom of the column. This corrects for the rate of change in declination. And in the increments and correction pages at the back of the book, we can find that correction. Now we move on to GHA, which is also listed in the daily pages. This time there's a V correction, also located at the bottom of the column. This accounts for changes in GHA, and again we'll go to the increments and corrections pages in the back, both to pull out the correction for the minutes and seconds, as well as the V correction. From there, it's just standard site. We'll determine our LHA and move forward from there. Let's do our calculations manually for this example. So we'll need to note the latitude, 
the declination and the LHA, and then convert them to decimal figures. So we'll write down the formula, and if you do out the math with your programmable calculator, you come up with a figure of decimal 2166. We convert that to degrees by taking the arc sign, and then we move on to the azimuth formula. This time we come up with a figure of decimal 3473. We take the arc cosine and come up with our azimuth figure. However, we need to apply our correction because the GP is west of the AP, and we get our true azimuth of 290.3 degrees. Once we've got our figures, we'll note the difference between the computed height and the observed height, and then head over to our plotting sheet to lay down our line of position. In this episode, we've taken a look at how to navigate by the stars and planets, and how you can use them to supplement your daytime fixes from the sun. But always remember that the sun is by far the most accurate object to shoot, and use it whenever possible. In the next episode, we'll take a look at the last sky object that we're going to learn about, the moon. But until then, practice what you've learned, refer to the notes below, and when you're ready, we'll move on.